Wandering Willie's Tale by Sir Walter Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Addison. Wandering Willie's Tale by Sir Walter Scott. Honest folks like me. How do you ken whether I am honest or what I am? I may be the devil himself or what ye ken, for he is poor to come disguised like an angel of light, and besides he is a prime fiddler. He played a sonata to Corelli, ye ken. There was something odd in this speech, and the tone in which it was said. It seemed as if my companion was not always in his constant mind, or that he was willing to try if he could frighten me. I laughed at the extravagance of his language, however, and asked him in reply if he was fool enough to believe that the foul fiend would play so silly a masquerade. "'Ye can little about it, little about it,' said the old man, shaking his head and beard, and knitting his brows. I could tell you something about that. What his wife mentioned of his being a tale-teller, as well as a musician, now occurred to me, and, as you know, I like tales of superstition. I begged to have a specimen of his talent as we went along. It is very true, said the blind man, that when I am tired of scraping therum or singing balance, I whiles make a tale serve the turn among the country bodies, and I have some fearsome aims that make the old Colleen shake on the settle, and the bits of barren skirl on their minnies out frae their beds. But this that I am going to tell you was a thing that befell in our ain house in my father's time. That is, my father was then a haplin's calant, and I tell it to you, that it may be a lesson to you, that I but a young, thoughtless chap, what ye draw up we on a lonely road, for muckle was the dool and care that came o' it to my good sire. He commenced his tale accordingly in a distinct narrative tone of voice, which he raised and depressed with considerable skill a time sinking almost into a whisper, and turning his clear but sightless eyeballs upon my face, as if it had been possible for him to witness the impression which his narrative made upon my features. I will not spare a syllable of it, although it be of the longest. So I make a dash, and begin. Ye mun have heard of Sir Robert Radgauntlet of that ilk, who lived in these parts before the dear years. The country will lang mind him, and our fathers used to draw breath thick if ever they heard him named. He was out with a Highlandman in Montrose's time, and again he was in the hills we Glencairn in the sixteen hundred and fifty twat, and said when King Charles the Second came in, Wa was in sick fever as the laird of Redgauntlet. He was knighted at Lunnon Court with the king's ain sword, and being a red hot proletist, he came down here rampaging like a lion, with commission of lieutenancy and of lunacy for what I can, to put down all the Whigs and Covenanters in the country. Wild work they made of it, for the Whigs were as dour as the Cavaliers were fierce, and it was which should first tire the other. Red Gauntlet was I for the strong hand, and his name is kenned as wide in the country as Clubhouses or Tam Dalyells. Glen, nor Dargal, nor Mountain, nor Cave could hide the poor hill-folk when Red Gauntlet was out with bugle and bloodhound after them, as if they had been so many deer. And truth, when they found them, 
they did na make muckle mair ceremony than a highlandman we a roebuck. It was just, will ye tak the test? If not, make ready, present, fire, and there lay the recusant. Far and weed was Sir Robert hated and feared. Men thought he had a direct compact with Satan, that he was proof against steel, and that bullets happed up his buff coat like hail stains from a hearth, that he had a mirror that would turn a hair on the side of Terrafragons, a precipitous side of a mountain in Moffatdale, and muckle to the same purpose of Wilk Mare Anon. The best blessing they wared on him was Deal Scope We Red Gauntlet. He was near bad master to his ain folk, though, and was weel enough liked by his tenants. And as for the lackeys and troopers that raid out to him to the persecutions, as the Whigs called those killing times, they would a drunken themselves blind to his health at any time. Now you are to ken that my good sire lived on Red Gauntlet's ground. They called the place Primrose No. We had lived on the ground and under the Red Gauntlets since the riding days and long before. It was a pleasant bit, and I think the air is callerer and fresher there than anywhere else in the country. It's all deserted now, and I sat on the broken dirt cheek three days since, and was glad I could not see the plight the place was in. But that's all wide of the mark. There had dwelt my good sire, Steeny Steenson, a rambling, rattling chill he had been in his young days, and could play a wheel on the pipes. He was famous at hoopers and girders, Oh, Cumberland could not touch him a chucky Latin, and he had the finest finger for the back lilt between Berwick and Carlisle. The like of Steeny was not the set that they made wigs of, and so he became a Tory, as they called it, which we now call Jacobites, just out of a kind of necessity that he might belong to some side or other. He had nae ill will to the Whig bodies, and liked little to see the blood run, though, being obliged to follow Sir Robert in hunting and hoisting, watching and warding, he saw muckle mischief, and maybe did some that he could not avoid. Now, Steeny was a kind of favourite with his master, and kenned all the folk about the castle, and was often sent for to play the pipes when they were at their merriment. Old Dougal McCullum the butler, that had followed Sir Robert through good and ill, thick and thin, pool and stream, was specially fond of the pipes, and I gave my good sire his good word with the laird, for Dougal could turn his master round his finger. Wheel, Roon came the revolution, and it had like to a broken the hearts, both the Dougal and his master. But the change was not altogether so great as they feared, and other folk thought for. The Whigs made an unco crawing what they would do with their old enemies, and in special we saw Robert Redgauntlet. But there were o'er many great folks dipped in the same doings to make a spick and span new world. So Parliament passed it o'er easy, and Sir Robert, baiting that he was held to hunting foxes instead of covenanters, remained just the man he was. His revel was as good, and his hall as weel lighted as ever it had been, though maybe he lacked the fines of the nonconformists that used to come to stock his larder and sell it, for it is certain he began to be keener about the rents than his tenants used to find him before. 
and they behooved to be prompt to the rent day, or else the laird was na pleased. And he was sick on awe somebody that naebody cared to anger him, for the odds he swore, and the rage that he used to get into, and the looks that he put on made men sometimes think him a devil incarnate. Weel, my good sire was nae manager, no that he was a very great misguided, but he had another saving gift, and he got twa terms rent in a way. He got the first brush at Whitsunday put o'er with fair wood and piping, but when Martin Mass came, there was a summons from the groaned officer to come with your rent on a day precise, or else Deany behoved to flit. Sarah work he had to get the siller, but he was weel friended, and at last he got the heel scraped together, a thousand marks. The maist of it was from a neighbour they called Larry Laprick, a sly tod. Larry had wealth the gear, could hunt with a hound and run with a hare, and be Whig or Tory, saint or sinner as the wind stood. He was a professor in the revolution world, but he liked an hour so of the world, and a tune on the pipes wheel enough for to buy time. And Buna, he thought he had good security for the siller. He lent my good sire o'er the stocking at Primrose no. Away trots my good sire to Red Gauntlet Castle, we a heavy purse and a light heart. Glad to be out to the laird's danger. Weel, the first thing he learned at the castle was that Sir Robert had fretted himself into a pit of the goat because he did no appear before twelve o'clock. It was not altogether for sake of the money, Dougal thought, but because he did not like to put with my good sire up the ground. Dougal was glad to see Steenie and brought him into the great oak parlour and there sat the laird, his leesome lane, excepting that he had beside him a great ill-favoured jackanip that was a special pet of his. A cankered beast it was, and mony an ill-natured trick it played. Ill to please it was, and easily angered, ran about the hail castle, chattering and rolling, and pinching and biting folk, specially before ill weather or disturbance in the state. Sir Robert called it Major Weir, after the wallock that was burnt, and few folk liked either the name or the conditions of the creature. They thought there was something in it by ordinary, and my good sire was not just easy in mind when the door shut on him, and he saw himself in the room with nobody but the laird, Dougal McCullum and the Major, a thing that hadn't a chance to him before. Sir Robert sat, or I should say lay, in a great armchair, wi' his grand velvet gown, and his feet on a cradle, for he had baith goot and gravel, and his face looked as gash and ghastly as Satan's. Major Weir sat opposite to him, in a red-laced coat, and the laird's wig on his head. And I, as Sir Robert garrand wi' pain, the jackanape garrand too, like a sheep's head between a pair of tongues, an ill fared fearsome couple they were. The laird's buff coat was hung on a pin behind him, and his broadsword and his pistols within reach, for he kept up the old fashion of having the weapons ready, and a horse saddle day and night, just as he used to do when he was able to loop on horseback and sway after any of the hill folk he could get spearings of. Some said it was for fear of the Whigs taking vengeance, but I judge it was just his old custom. He was again not fear anything, the rental book, with its black cover and brass clasps, was lying beside him, 
and a book of skulldudery songs was put betwixt the leaves to keep it open at the place where it bore evidence against the good man of Primrose No, as behind the hand with his mails and duties. Sir Robert gave my good sayer a look, as if he would have withered his heart in his bosom. Ye man ken, he had a way of bending his brows, that men saw the visible mark of a horseshoe in his forehead, deep dinted, as if it had been stamped there. Ah, ye come, light-handed, ye son of a tomb whistle, said Sir Robert. Zones up ye are. My good sire, with as good a countenance as he could put on, made a leg, and placed the bag of money on the table we had dashed like a man that does something clever. The lad drew it to him hastily. Is all here, steeny man? Your honour will find it right, said my good sire. Here, Dougal, said the laird. Give steeny a tuss of brandy till I count the cellar and write the receipt. But they were a wheel out of the room when Sir Robert gied a yellock that garred the castle rock back ran dougal in flew the livery men yell on yell geet the laird ilk ain mair awful than the other my good sire knew not whether to stand or flee but he ventured back into the parlour where ah was going hurdy gurdy naebody to say come in or gae out terribly the lad read for cold water to his feet, and wine to cool his throat, and hell, 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 and his flames, was I the word in his mouth. They brought him water, and when they plunged his swollen feet into the tub, he cried out it was burning, and folks say that it did bubble and sparkle like a seething cauldron. He flung the cup at Dougal's head, and said he had given him blood into the burgundy. And sure enough, the last washed clotted blood off the carpet the next day. The jackanape they caught Major Weir, it gibbered and cried as if it was mocking its master. My good sire's head was like to turn. He forgot both cellar and receipt, and downstairs he banged. But as he ran, the shrieks came fainter and fainter. There was a deep-drawn shivering groan, and word gave to the castle that the laird was dead. Weel, away came my good sire, with his finger in his mouth, and his best hope was that Dougal had seen the money-bag and heard the laird speak of writing the receipt. The young laird now Sir John came from Edinburgh to see things put to rights. Sir John and his father never greed weel. Sir John had been bred an advocate, and afterwards sat in the last Scots Parliament and voted for the Union, having gotten, it was thought, a rug of the compensations. If his father could have come out of his grave, he would have brained him for it on his own hearthstone. Some thought it was easier counting with the old rough knight than the fair-spoken youngin, but mayor of that anon. Dougal Macallum, poor body, neither grat nor grained, but geared about the house, looking like a curf, but directing as was his duty, or the order of the grand funeral. Now Dougal looked I war and war when night was coming, and was I the last again to his bed. Wilk was in a little room, just opposite the chamber of Deus, Wilk his master occupied while he was living, and where he now lay in state, as they called it, wheel a day. The night before the funeral, Dougal could keep his own counsel nae longer. He came doon wi' his proud spirit, and fairly asked old Hutchin to sit in his room with him for an hour. When they were in the room, 
Dougal took a tess of brandy to himself, and gave another to Hutchin, and wished him all health and long life, and said that for himself he was near long for this world, for that every night since Sir Robert's death his silver call had sounded from the state chamber, just as it used to do at nights in his lifetime, to call Dougal to help to turn him in his bed. Dougal said that being alone with the dead on that floor of the tower, for nobody cared to wake Sir Robert or had gauntlet like another corpse. He had never dared to answer the call, for that now his conscience checked him for neglecting his duty. For though death breaks service, said MacCullum, it shall never weak my service to Sir Robert, and I will answer his next whistle, so be you will stand by me, Hutchin. Hutchin had nae will to the work, but he had stood by Dougal in bottle and boil, and he would not fail him at this pinch. So doon the carl sat o'er a stoop of brandy, and Hutchin, who was something of a clack, would have read a chapter of the Bible, but Dougal would hear nothing but a blood of Davy Lindsay, which was the wear of preparation. When midnight came, and the house was quiet as the grave, sure enough the silver whistle sounded a sharp and shrill, as if Sir Robert was blowing it, and up got the twa old serving men, and tottered into the room where the dead man lay. Huchen saw a no at the first glance, for there were torches in the room, which showed him the foul fiend in his ain shape, sitting on the laird's coffin. Or he cooked as if he had been dead. He could not tell how long he lay in a trance at the door, but when he gathered himself, he cried on his neighbour, and getting nay answer raised the hoosts, when Dougal was found lying dead within twa steps of the bed where his master's coffin was placed. As for the whistle, it was gain ains and ae, but many a time was it heard at the top of the house on the bartizan, and among the old chimneys and turrets where the howlets had their nests. Sir John hushed the matter up, and the funeral passed over without mere bogeywork. But when all was o'er, and the laird was beginning to settle his affairs, every tenant was called up for his arrears, and my good sire, for the full sum that stood against him in the rental book. Weel, away he trots to the castle to tell his story, and there he is introduced to Sir John, sitting in his father's chair in deep mourning, with weepers and hanging cravats and a small walking rapier by his side, instead of the old broadsword that had a hundred weight of steel about it, what with blade, shape, and basket hilt. I have heard the communing so often told over that I almost think I was there myself, though I could not be born at the time. In fact, Alan, my companion, mimicked with a good deal of humour, the flattering, conciliating tone of the tenant's address, and the hypocritical melancholy of the laird's reply. His grandfather, he said, had, while he spoke, his eyes fixed on the rental book, as if it were a mastiff dog that he was afraid would spring up and bite him. "'I wish you joy, sir, of the head-seat, and the white loaf, and the bread lordship, your father was a kind man to friends and followers. Muckle grace to you, Sir John, to fill his shoon. His boots, I should say, for he seldom wore shoon, unless it were mules, when he had the goat. Aye, Steenie, quoth the laird, sighing deeply, and putting his napkin to his een. His was a sudden call, and he will be missed in the country. No time to set his house in order. Weel prepared Godward, no doubt, which is the root of the matter, but left us behind a tangled hesp to wine, Steenie. Hum, hum, we men go to business, Steenie, much to do, and little time to do it in. 
here he opened the fatal volume i have heard of a thing they call doomsday book i am clear it has been a rental of backganging tenants stephen said sir john still in the same soft sleek tone of voice stephen stevenson or steenson ye are down here for a year's rent behind the hand due at last term stephen please your honour sir john i paid it to your father sir john ye took a receipt then doubtless stephen and can produce it stephen indeed i had not time on it like your honour for nay sooner had i set down the cellar and just as his honour sir robert that's gain do it to enter count it and write up the receipt he was ta'en with the pains that removed him that was unlucky said sir john after a pause but ye may be paid it in the presence of somebody i want but a talis qualis evidence stephen i would go o'er strictly to work with no poor man stephen truth sir john there was nobody in the room but dougal mccullum the butler but as your honour kens he has e'en followed his old master very unlucky again stephen said sir john without altering his voice a single note the man to whom ye paid the money is dead and the man who witnessed the payment is dead too and the cellar which should have been to the fort is neither seen nor heard tell of in the repositories how am i to believe all this stephen i dinna ken your honour but there is a bit memorandum note of the very coins for god help me i had to borrow out of twenty purses and i am sure that ilk a man there set down will take his great oath for what purpose i borrowed the money sir john i have little doubt ye borrowed the money steenie it is the payment that i want to have proof of stephen the cellar mun be about the host sir john and since your honour never got it and his honour that was canna have ta'en it wi him maybe some of the family may have seen it sir john we will examine the servant stephen that is but reasonable but lackey and lass and page and groom all denied stoutly that they had ever seen such a bag of money as my good sire described what saw were he had unluckily not mentioned to any living soul of them his purpose of paying his rent i queen had noticed something under his arm but she took it for the pipes sir john read gauntlet ordered the servants out of the room and then said to my good sire now steenie you see you have fair play and as i have little doot ye ken better where to find the cellar than any other body i beg in fair terms and for your own sake that you will end this fashery for stephen ye mun pay or flit the lord forgie your opinion said stephen driven almost to his wit's end i am an honest man so am i stephen said his honour and so are all the folks in the house i hope but if there be a knave amongst us it must be he that tells the story he cannot prove he paused and then added mere sternly if i understand your trick sir you want to take advantage of some malicious reports concerning things in this family and particularly respecting my father's sudden death thereby to cheat me out of the money and perhaps take away my character by insinuating that i have received the rent i am demanding where do you suppose the money to be i insist upon knowing my good sire so everything looked so muckle against him that he grew nearly desperate however he shifted from one foot to another looked to every corner of the room and made no answer speak out sir said the lad 
assuming a look of his father's, a very particular ain which he had when he was angry. It seemed as if the wrinkles of his frown made that self-same fearful shape of a horse's shoe in the middle of his brow. Speak out, sir, I will know your thoughts. Do you suppose that I have this money? Far be it from me to say so, said Stephen. Do you charge any of my people with having taken it? I would be late to charge them that may be innocent, said my good sir. And if there be any one that is guilty, I have any proof. Somewhere the money must be, if there is a word of truth in your story, said Sir John. I ask where you think it is, and demand a correct answer. In hell, if you will, have my thoughts of it, said my good sire, driven to extremity. In hell, with your father, his chicken ape and his silver whistle. Down the stairs he ran, for the parlour was no place for him after such a word, and he heard the laird swearing blood and wounds behind him, as fast as ever did Sir Robert, and roaring for the bailey and the baron officer. Away rode my good sire to his chief creditor, him they called Lorry Le Prick, to try if he could make anything out of him. But when he told his story, he got the worst word in his wame. Thief, beggar, and diva were the softest terms, and to the boot of these hard terms, Larry brought up the ale story of dipping his hand in the blood of God's saints, just as if a tenant could have helped riding with the laird, and that a laird like Sir Robert Redgauntlet. My good sire was by this time far beyond the bounds of patience, and while he and Larry were at deal speed the liars, he was one chancy enough to abuse the prick's doctrine as weel as the man, and said things that garred folk's flesh grew that heard them. He was near just himself, and he had lived wi a wild set in his day. At last they parted, and my good sire was to ride hame through the wood of Pitmarkey. That is a foe of black furrows, as they say I ken the wood but the furrows may be black or white for what I can tell. At the entry of the wood there is a wild common, and on the edge of the common a little lonely change-house that was keepeth then by an hostler wife. They should have called her to be four, and there poor Steenie cried for a muchkin of brandy, for he had had no refreshment the heel day. Tibby was earnest wee him to take a bite of meat, but he could not think of it, nor would he take his foot out of the stirrup, and took up the brandy wholly at twa draughts, and named the toast at each. The first was the memory of Sir Robert Redgauntlet, and may he never lie quiet in his grave till he had righted his poor bond tenant, and the second was a health to man's enemy, if he would but get him back the fuck of Selick, or tell him what came of it for he saw the whole world was like to regard him as a thief and a cheat, and he took that word than even the ruin of his house and hold. On he rode, little caring where. It was a dark night turned, and the trees made it yet darker, and he let the beast take its ain road through the wood, when all of a sudden, from tired and wearied that it was before, the nag began to spring and flee and stand, that my good sire could hardly keep the saddle. Upon the wilt, a horseman, suddenly riding up beside him, said, That's a metal beast of yours, friend. Will you sell him? So saying, he touched the horse's neck with his riding wand, and it fell into its old hey-ho of a stumbling trot. But he sprung soon out of him, I think, continued the stranger, and that is like many a man's courage that thinks he would do great things. My good sire scarce listened to this, but spurred his horse with good e'en to your friend. But it's like the stranger was e'en that does not like to yield his point, for ride as steeny like he was a beside him at the self-same pace. At last my good sire Steenie Steenson 
grew half angry, and to say the truth, half feared. What is it that you want with me, friend? he said. If ye be a robber, I have nae money. If ye be a leal man, wanting company, I have nae heart to mouth or speaking. And if ye want to ken the road, I scarce ken it myself. If you will tell me your grief, said the stranger, I am one that, though I have been sair miscarred in the world, and the only hand for helping my friends. So my good sire, to ease his ain heart, mair than from any hope of help, told him the story from beginning to end. It's a hard pinch, said the stranger, but I think I can help you. If you could lend me the money, sir, and take a long day, I can nae other help on earth, said my good sire. But there may be some under the earth, said the stranger. Come, I'll be frank with ye. I could lend you the money on bond, but you would maybe scruple my terms. Now, I can tell you that your old laird is disturbed in his grave by your curses and the wailing of your family, and if you dare venture to go to see him, he will give you the receipt. My good sire's hair stood on end at this proposal, but he thought his companion might be some humoursome child that was trying to frighten him, and might end with lending him the money. Besides, he was bold with brandy, and desperate with distress, and he said he had courage to go to the gate of hell, and a step farther for that receipt. The stranger laughed. Weel, they rode on through the thickest of the wood, when all of a sudden the horse stopped at the door of a great house, and but that he knew the place was ten miles off, my father would have thought he was at Red Gauntlet Castle. They rode into the outer courtyard, through the muckle folding yets, and underneath the old portcullis, and the whole front of the house was lighted, and there were pipes and fiddles, and as much dancing and deray within, as used to be at Sir Robert's house at Pace and Yule, and such high seasons. They lap up, and my good sire, as seemed to him, fastened his horse to the very ring he had tied him to that morning, when he gave to wait on the young Sir John. God, said my good sire, if Sir Robert's death be but a dream. He knocked at the hard door, just as he was wont, and his old acquaintance, Dougal McCullum, just after his wont too, came to open the door, and said, Piper Steeny, are you there, lad? Sir Robert has been crying for you. My good sire was like a man in a dream. He looked for the stranger, but he was gain for the time. At last he just tried to say, Ah, a dougal drive or are you living? I thought you had been dead. Never fash yourself wi me, said Dougal, but look to yourself, and see you take nothing from anybody here, neither meat, drink, or siller, except the receipt that is your ain. So saying, he led the way out through the halls and trances that were well kenned to my good sire, and into the old oak parlour, and there was as much singing of profane songs, and barrelling of red wine, and blasphemy, and skulldudery, as had ever been in Red Gauntlet Castle, when it was at the blithest. But, Lord, take us in keeping! What a set of ghastly revellers there were that sat around that table! My good sire kenned many, that had long before gained to their place, for often that he piped to the most part in the hall of Red Gauntlet. There was the fierce Middleton, and the dissolute Rothers, and the crafty Lauderdale, and Daliel with his bald head and a beard to his girdle, and Earl Shaw with Cameron's blood on his hand, and wild Bonshaw that tied blessed Mr. Cargill's limbs till the blood sprung, and Dumbarton Douglas, the twice-turned traitor beat the country and king. 
there was the bloody advocate Mackenyi, who for his worldly wit and wisdom had been to the rest as a god. And there was Clever House, as beautiful as when he lived, with his long, dark, curled locks streaming down over his laced buff coat, and with his left hand always on his right spool blade to hide the wound that the silver bullet had made. He sat apart from them all and looked at them with a melancholy, haughty countenance, while the rest hallooed and sang and laughed that the room rang. But their smiles were fearfully contorted from time to time, and their laughter passed into such wild sounds as made my good sire's very nails grow blue and chilled the marrow in his bones. They that waited at the table were just the wicked serving men and troopers that had done their work and cruel bidding on earth. There was the lang lad of the nether tone that helped to take our guile, and the bishop's summoner that they called the deal's rattle-bag, and the wicked guardsmen in their laced coats, and the savage highland Amorites that shed blood like water, and many a proud serving man haughty of heart and bloody of hand, cringing to the rich and making them wickeder than they would be, grinding the poor to powder when the rich had broken them to fragments, and many, many mer were coming and ganging, are ah, as busy in their vacation as if they had been alive. Sir Robert Red Gauntlet, in the midst of all this fearful riot, cried with a voice like thunder, on Steenie Piper to come to the boardhead, where he was sitting, his legs stretched out before him, and swathed up with flannel, with his holster pistols aside him, while the great broadsword rusted against his chair, just as my good sail had seen him the last time upon earth. The very cushion for the jackanape was close to him, but the creature itself was not there. It was not its hour, it's likely for he heard them say as he came forward, Is not the major come yet? And another answered, The jackanape will be here betimes the morn. And when my good sire came forward, Sir Robert, or his ghost, or the devil in his likeness, said, Weel, Piper, are ye settled with my son for the years of rent? With much ado, my father got breath to say, that Sir John would not settle without his honour's receipt. Ye shall have that for a tune of the pipe, Steenie, said the appearance of Sir Robert. Play us up, weel huddled lucky. Now this was a tune my good sire learned for a warlock that heard it when they were worshipping Satan at their meetings, and my good sire had sometimes played it at the ranting suppers in Red Gauntlet Castle, but never very willingly, and now he grew cold at the very name of it, and said for excuse he had nice pipes wi' him. Macallum, ye lamb of Beelzebub, said the fearful Sir Robert, bring Steeny the pipes that I am keeping for him. Macallum brought a pair of pipes, might have served the piper of Donald of the Isles but he gave my good sire a nudge as he offered them, and looking secretly and closely, Steenie saw that the chanter was of steel and heated to a white heat, so he had fair warning not to trust his fingers with it. So he excused himself again, and said he was faint and frightened, and had not wind enough to fill the bag. Then ye man eat and drink, Steenie, said the figure, for we do little else here, and it's ill speaking between a four man and a fasting. Now these were the very words that the bloody Earl of Douglas said to keep the king's messenger in hand while he cut the head of MacLennan of Bombay at the Threve Castle, and put Steeny mare and mare on his guard. So he spoke up like a man, and said he came neither to eat nor drink nor make minstrelsy, but simply for his aim to ken what was come of the money he had paid 
and to get a discharge for it. And he was so stout-hearted by this time, that he charged Sir Robert for conscience's sake. He had no power to say the holy name, and as he hoped for peace and rest, to spread no snares for him, but just to give him his aim. The appearance gnashed its teeth and laughed, but it took from a large pocket-book the receipt, and handed it to Steenie. There is your receipt, ye pitiful cat, and for the money my dog whelp of a son, I go look for it in the cat's cradle. My good sire uttered many thanks, and was about to return, when Sir Robert roared aloud, Stop, thou, thou suck doddling son of a... I am not done with thee. Here, we do nothing for nothing, and you must return on this very day twelve months to pay your master the homage that you owe me for my protection. My father's tongue was loosed to a sudden teeth, and he said aloud, I refer myself to God's pleasure and not to yours. He had no sooner uttered the word then all was dark around him, and he sank on the earth with such a sudden shock that he lost both breath and sense. How long Steenie lay there he could not tell, but when he came to himself he was lying in the old cuckyard of Redgauntlet Parishon, just at the door of the family aisle, and the scutcheon of the old knight Sir Robert hanging over his head. There was a deep morning fog on grass and gravestone around him, and his horse was feeding quietly beside the minister's twa cows. Steenie would have thought the hall was a dream, but he had the receipt in his hand, fairly written and signed by the old laird. Only the last letters of his name were a little disorderly, written like one seized with sudden pain. Sorely troubled in his mind, he left that dreary place, rode through the mist of Red Gauntlet Castle, and with much ado he got speech of the laird. Well, ye diver bankrupt, was the first word. Have ye brought me my rent? No, answered my good sire, I have not, but I have brought your honour Sir Robert's receipt for it. How, Sir, Sir Robert's receipt? You told me he had not given you one. Will your honour please to see it? That bit line is right. Sir John looked at every line and at every letter with much attention, and at last at the date, which my good sire had not observed. From my appointed place, he read, this twenty-fifth of November. What? That is yesterday. Full on thou must have gone to hell for this. I got it from your honour's father, whether he be in heaven or hell, I know not, said Steenie. I will debate you for a warlock to the privy council, said Sir John. I will send you to your master the devil with the help of a tar barrel and a torch. I intend to debate my soul to the presbytery, said Steenie, and tell them all I have seen last night. Work of things fitter for them to judge of than a barrel man like me. Sir John paused, composed himself and desired to hear the full history, and my good sire told it him from point to point, as I have told it you, neither more nor less. Sir John was silent again for a long time, and at last he said very composedly, Steenie, this story of yours concerns the honour of many a noble family besides mine, and if it be a leasing-making to keep yourself out of my danger, the least you can expect is to have a red-hot iron driven through your tongue, and that will be as bad as scalding your fingers we a red-hot chant at. But yet it may be true, Steenie, and if the money cast up, I shall not know what to think of it. But where shall we find the cat's cradle? There are cats enough about the old house, but I think they kitten without the ceremony of bed or cradle. We were best ask Hutchin, said my good sire, he cans o'er the odd corners about as well as another serving man that is now gain, and that I would not like to name. Ah, weel, Hutchian, when he was asked, told them that a ruinous turret lang disused, next to the clock-house, only accessible by a ladder, for the opening was on the outside, above the battlements, 
was called of old the cat's cradle there will i go immediately said sir john and he took with what purpose heaven kens one of his father's pistols from the hall table where they had lain since the night he died and hastened to the battlements it was a dangerous place to climb for the ladder was old and frail and wanted ain or two runes however up got sir john and entered at the turret door where his body stopped the only little light that was in the bit turret something flees at him we a vengeance mayst dang him back or bang gave the knight's pistol and hutchian that held the ladder and my good sire that stood beside him hears a loud skullock a minute after sir john flings the body of the jackanapes down to them and cries that the cellar is fund and that they should come up and help him and there was the beggar cellar sure enough and many are a thing besides that had been missing for many a day and so john when he had riped the turret wheel led my good sire into the dining parlour and took him by the hand and spoke kindly to him and said he was sorry he should have doubted his word and that he would hereafter be a good master to him to make amends and now steenie said sir john although this vision of yours tends on the whole to my father's credit as an honest man that he should even after his death desire to see justice done to a poor man like you yet you are sensible that ill-dispositioned men might make bad constructions upon it concerning his soul's health so i think we had better lay the hair derdom on that ill deedy creature major weir and say nothing about your dream in the wood of it murky you had taen o'er muckle brandy to be very certain about anything and steeny this receipt his hand shook while he held it out it's but a queer kind of document and we will do best i think to put it quietly in the fire Odd, but for as queer as it is it's all the voucher i have for my rent said my good sir who was afraid it may be of losing the benefit of sir robert's discharge i will bear the contents to your credit in the rental book and give you a discharge under my own hand said sir john and that on the spot and steenie if you can hold your tongue about this matter you shall sit from this time downward at an easier rent money thanks to your honour said steenie who saw easily in what corner the wind was a doubtless i will be conformable to all your honour's commands only i would willingly speak with some powerful minister on the subject for i do not like the sort of summons of appointment which your honour's father do not call the phantom my father said sir john interrupting him wheel then the thing that was so like him said my good sir he spoke of my coming back to see him this time twelve month and it's a weight on my conscience ah wheel then said sir john if ye be so much distressed in mind ye may speak to our minister of the parish he is a douce man regards the honour of our family and the mayor that he may look for some patronage from me with that my father readily agreed that the receipt should be burnt and the laird threw it into the chimney with his ain hand burn it would not for them though but away it blew up the lum we a long train of sparks at its tail and a hissing noise like a squib my good sire gave down to the man and the minister when he had heard the story said it was his real opinion that though my good sir had gone very far in tempering with dangerous matters yet as he had refused the devil's arrows for such was the offer of meat and drink and had refused to do homage by piping at his bidding he hoped that if he held a circumspect walk hereafter satan could take little advantage by what was come and gain and indeed my good sire of his ain accord long forswore both the pipes and the brandy it was not even till the year was out 
and the fatal day passed that he would so much as take the fiddle or drink a scabar or tippany. Sir John made up his story about the jackanape as he liked himself, and some believe till this day there was no more in the matter than the filching nature of the brute. Indeed, he'll no hinder some to thread that it was nane of the old enemy that Dougal and Hutchian saw in the laird's room, but only that one chancy creature the major capering on the coffin, and that as to the blowing on the laird's whistle that was heard after he was dead, the filthy brute could do that as well as the laird himself, if no better. But heaven kens the truth, will first came out by the minister's wife, after Sir John and her ain good man were bathed in the moulds. And then my good sir, who has failed in his limbs, but not in his judgment or memory, at least nothing to speak of, was obliged to tell the real narrative to his friends, for the credit of his good name. He might else have been charged for a warlock. The shades of evening were growing thicker around us, as my conductor finished his long narrative with this moral. Yes, see, Berkey, it is nae chancy thing to take a stranger traveller for a guide when you're in an uncouth land. I should not have made that inference, said I. Your grandfather's adventure was fortunate for himself, whom it saves from ruin and distress, and fortunate for his landlord. I but they had bathed to sup the sauce of it sooner or later, said wondering Willie. What was frusted was near forgiven. Sir John died before he was much over three score, and it was just like a moment's illness. And for my good sire, though he departed in fullness of life, yet there was my father, a young man of forty-five, fell down betwixt the stilts of his plough, and raised never again, and left nae baron but me, a poor, sightless, fatherless, motherless creature, could neither work nor want. Things gaed well enough at first, for Sir Redwald Red Gauntlet, the only son of Sir John, and the eye of old Sir Robert, and weighs me, the last of the honourable house took the ferrum of her hands, and brought me into his household to have care of me. I had never settled since I lost him, and if I say another word about it, deal about will I have the heart to play the night. Look out, my gentle chap, he resumed in a different tone. You should see the lights at Buckenburn Glen by this time. End of Wandering Woolly's Tale